When civil war broke out in England in 1642, there was a divide in Scotland between those who wanted to join the war on the side of the English parliamentarians, the Covenanters, who were ultra-Presbyterians that wanted to create a godly state in Scotland, whereby they ruled through the word of God and the parliament had the full authority of the state. They wanted to depose the king, Charles I. Now, by 17th century standards, this was considered pretty extreme, because what you got to remember about the 17th century is that the monarchy was like an actual job back then. Like, the king had stuff that he was expected to do. It's not like nowadays, you know. And even then, if someone was to suggest that we depose the queen, that would be considered extreme, despite the fact that she would just continue to do fuck all. And so for many, the extreme political and religious views of the Covenanters, they were too much to handle. And so they wanted to support the royalist forces of Charles I. And the two men that headed up these different factions in Scotland, their rivalry would dominate Scotland in the 1640s. Head of the Covenanters was the Marcus of Argyle, who may have been an extreme Bible basher, but he was an astute politician. And at least he wasn't grabby, you know, like some other extreme political leaders. Although I'll tell you what, fair play to Alex Salmond. Do you know what I mean? Like just a year and a bit ago, that guy had no idea what list he would end up being on. And head of the Royalist movement was James Graham, the Marcus of Montrose, the great Montrose, one of the most swashbuckling characters from Scottish history. Montrose headed up a series of brilliant military victories over the years 1644 and 1645 that's been remembered as the Year of Miracles in Scotland. Now, neither the Marcus of Montrose nor the Marcus of Argyll had anything like the influence on the English Parliament that the Marcus of Rashford had. But Montrose's campaign right from the beginning, the odds were stacked against him. The royalist cause in Scotland didn't look good until the arrival of an Irish adventurer, Alistair Macola MacDonald, in September 1644. Now, Macola MacDonald was an Irish war hero. He had fought for the Irish Confederacy who had successfully installed Catholic self-governance in Ireland. He was the son of the Laird of Colonsey, but... He was Scottish, but fought for Ireland. He was like the 17th century's Aidan McGeady. And in Scotland, he saw an opportunity to destroy Clan Campbell. Now, the rivalry between the McDonald's and the Campbells is one that's not just based on disgusting foodstuffs. It goes back centuries. Clan Campbell are Presbyterian. The head of Clan Campbell was the Marcus of Argyll, whom McDonald despised even more than Montrose did. And after the Reformation in Scotland, the Macdonalds had remained predominantly Catholic. But the rise to prominence of Clan Campbell in the 16th and 17th centuries meant that a lot of traditional Macdonald heartlands were now under the control of Clan Campbell. And Macola Macdonald, he saw an opportunity to come over and win these lands back for Clan Macdonald and to burn and slay and slaughter as many Campbells as he could in the process, which he did with zeal, by the way. An easy way to remember it is uh, Macaulay MacDonald gave Montrose military aid. Macaulay MacDonald, the Campbells, he burned and slayed. It was his Campbell free philosophy. Macaulay MacDonald. Thank you very much. You're now not going to be able to watch The Lion King ever again without thinking about clan genocide. You're welcome, by the way. And so the first of Montrose and Macdonald's spectacular victories came at Tippermuir outside of Perth in September 1644. Over the next year, Montrose would win eight battles, all of which he was outnumbered, he was outgunned. But every covenanting army that was sent to put him down, he destroyed. It was incredible. It was like winning eight Bannock Burns back to back in a single year. Montrose would use brilliant surprise tactics. He had his men, for example, march through waist deep snow to launch a surprise attack on the Covenanters at Inverlochy. He attacked the heartland of Campbell territory, Inverary Castle, forcing the Marcus of Argyll to escape in a galley down Loch Fine like a Presbyterian pirate. By the end of summer 1645, Montrose had instilled himself as master of Scotland. He had eliminated all opposition in Scotland. He was like Nicola Sturgeon. But the success of the Royalist campaign in Scotland was not the same in England. It was complete shite, but was somehow very successful in Scotland. It was like Jerry Cinnamon, I suppose. 
And so, when the English parliamentarians won a decisive battle in England, the Battle of Naseby, the Covenanters who had been fighting in England could now concentrate on the apparently indestructible Montrose, whom they defeated in a surprise attack at Philip Hall near Selkirk in the, border, in the borders in September 1645. Montrose, he escaped to Europe. And when he learned of Charles I's execution in 1649, he retired to his bedchamber for two days, which is fuck all compared to how we mourn royals in the 21st century. And when the Scots crowned Charles' son, Charles II, the new king sent Montrose a royal commission encouraging him to invade Scotland on his behalf. And so Montrose, he recruited 500 Danish and German mercenaries wearing socks and sandals and he sailed to Orkney where he recruited another thousand um, enthusiastic Orcadians. He recruited them directly from a strip the willow. But Montrose's royalist movement in Scotland had lost support in his absence and unlike, unlike Ruth Davidson he didn't have the security of a peerage in the House of Lords to fall back on now that he wasn't as popular in Scotland. And Montrose, he was defeated in the Battle of Carbisdale in Sutherland in April 1560, after which he had to swim the Kyle of Sutherland and wander for three days alone in the wilderness of the West Highlands to escape. It was like the Revenant, you know, except instead of being tracked by a Native American tribe, he was being tracked by angry Presbyterians. And instead of being attacked by a bear, he was being attacked by midges, which I would argue is far worse, by the way. After three days of wandering in the wilderness, he arrived at Ardvec Keep on, uh, on the shores of Loch Acid, where he was promised food and shelter, but instead they had him locked in the dungeon. It was the ultimate betrayal of Highland hospitality, which states that regardless of who turns up at your door, you must be friendly and hospitable, even if they're flying for the Scottish Conservative Party. On the 22nd of May, 1560, Montrose was publicly hanged for three hours in the grass market in Edinburgh before he was beheaded. His head was placed on top of a pike in the Tollbooth prison in Edinburgh. His limbs were hacked off and sent to Aberdeen, Perth, Stirling and Glasgow where they were deep fat fried and served in the local chip shops. But just 10 years after Montrose's execution, the people who had fought against him suddenly decided that actually they quite liked the monarchy. It was a kind of George Galloway style turnaround. And Charles II, he was restored in 1660 to the thrones of the three kingdoms. And one of the first things that he did was he had Montrose's body reinterred in a fantastic marble tomb at St Giles Cathedral in Edinburgh, which you can still visit to this day. Montrose, he was given the most lavish state funeral that anyone has ever been given in Scotland. They laid on an amazing, incredible funeral for him because they felt guilty about how he died. It's the exact same as Princess Diana, basically. And so the great Montrose, one of the most swashbuckling characters from Scottish history, a genius who was loyal to an incredibly flawed king, Charles I. And I'm going to tell you all about the rule or the reign of uh, Charles I's son, Charles II, and a little bit more about the Covenanters next time. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>